So thank you very much for that talk. Um, I, you know, we have we have been thinking about about some of the things you have been touching touching already, and I, I really like how you how the fields of applications like particle mesh codes and fluid codes are really close to to the codes we are actually using, and and thus I see a lot of connections there already in, in terms of um, using those codes. One one of the very so so when thinking about this problem, it always comes to my mind that somehow we the the, the mathematical descriptions like the tensors um, they are ubiquitous and they are very good good um, uh, way of of doing a lot of the stuff that we need to do. However, I sometimes have the feeling that um, we, we are kind of conditioned to certain ways of expressing our problems due to 40 years of, of, uh, uh, of, of the hardware and Fortran and, and, and everything, you know, like, like looking like linear, linear algebra and, and continuous memory, you know? It's kind of, we are so conditioned in, in terms of, of looking at these problems that I think work like, like yours ex is extremely valuable in the sense that we go back and what is the what is the most natural way to express our problems and then to see how it actually maps to to hardware and and I wanted to to get a bit of your view for example you, you already mentioned nonlinear problems which are not so easy to to paralyze anymore and and to really do this. So what is your view on that? Where do you th think this is going? Because I think the applications are getting more and more complex and it's harder and harder to really use the hardware in the right way. So do you think we should also look at a different hardware like in memory computing or do you think that, that we will for a very long time still write dialects of Fortran in, in some way? <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Michelle, for, for the comment, I think. So maybe uh, also let me let me comment a little bit on the on the tensors. So I agree that tensors are like a very natural way to express many different things. So and, and there is, I mean, we, we have done work in tensors, but there's a lot of work previous to us, like the TCE engine people that have been working on quantum chemistry, a lot of those things are like super complicated tensor expressions. And also there is a, a TACO compiler from MIT. So there's a lot of um, tensor expression languages out there and, and that kind of just evidence that they are, they are needed. Um, I think, and, and maybe something that I will preempt maybe some questions here is that, of course you can use libraries to do these kind of things, but the motivation for us in, in, in working with the DSL was that actually for the people writing these codes, the libraries were not doing exactly what they wanted. And sometimes depending on the parameters of the tensor expression, you would have, you would like to work, write it in some way and maybe sometimes use it in another way. And that's why I think DSLs are uh, so interesting. And in the connection with this old Fortran code bases, that's what we are kind of learning with the people in, in Italy and this, in this WORF model. Um, I, I, the, the way we want to integrate these this tensor abs uh, abstractions or these DSLs in general, um, is is by gradually moving some pieces of the code, right? It's, it's gonna be, it's impossible to move all the code to the cell and that's also not the purpose. It's a, it's a way to be able to annotate pieces of the code and just write there the, the mathematical expression and have code generated for that. And I think the, I think to connect to what you ask as well is, uh, now the applications are interconnected. And so it's not only worth, but it's what comes after worth, or maybe some extra analysis that you want to do on the data. So there is some convergence in this, in these aspects, may, making applications more complex, right? So you want to maybe stream data into into some machine learning model that is learning, so that you not always have to simulate. And so I think there is a lot of like from from these tensor expressions that are say in, in the scope, they are rather limited. Uh, we are starting to look into how can we also um, account for the connection of these different modules and maybe also optimize um, optimize those interfaces away or, opti or optimize 
across uh, interfaces, across function boundaries. That is something that you cannot do when you use uh, libraries. Okay, so I hope that more or less answers some of the things that you, that you mentioned. The, the, the final thing that I think you mentioned was whether you should be looking into in-memory computing. Um, so I, I, I see a lot of potential in in-memory or near-memory computing. So I, just to make a distinction there, in-memory computing, if you, if you see that in, in presentations, in-memory computing means that you are using the memory cells to do computing. Near-memory computing means that within the memory chip, for instance, in the DRAM memory chip, you have a logic layer that is close to the memory, and that logic layer can do computation close to the memory. Okay, so those, those are two different types of, of technologies. In-memory computing is has been discussed in research for a long time, and so you can do that in, in DRAM and so on, but it's been very difficult to, to, to really productize. Now with PCN, maybe that's going to happen. So I think in-memory computing is a little bit further down the line. Near memory computing is something for which there are already chips in the market uh, from AppMem and, and Samsung recently also released a way to do that. Like you have DRAM chips and within these DRAM chips, you have a bunch of chips that are doing computations uh, directly on DRAM data. I do think that's a very interesting, interesting um, architecture. That's why we're working on this. On this. Um, whether you should be looking into this right now, I'm not, I'm not sure. So I think it would be interesting to understand if these um, architectures will lend themselves to the kind of codes that you want to accelerate. So if you have a gigabytes of data and, and if the computations that if some pre-processing computations are easy enough and, and linearly enough, that will work because most of these in-memory or near-memory uh, accelerators uh, would have built-in support for arithmetic, very simple arithmetic, and some nonlinear functions. But with nonlinear functions, I meant the nonlinear functions that you have in machine learning, like ReLU, Sigmoid, that kind of stuff. So maybe not something that you, you that you had in mind. Okay, thank you very much. That was that was. As I said, I think I, I think really doing these these abstractions is a, is a is a very good way to to cover more of the complexity of today's code, and it's it's really hard to do this, as you say, in libraries. I think this is a this yeah. is a very very valid ob observation and, and something that's. Of course, if I can do more more intelligent stuff by by directly looking at a DSL and put in putting it on metal, I think that is a, that is a very smart way to go. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. You have another raised hand from up enough, please. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, it's a very interesting talk. Thank you, Professor Girolamo. Uh, I was wondering about the expression systems inside the uh, inside the languages itself. Because uh, what if we we identify these abstractions for a certain class of problems, and then uh, we choose these abstractions carefully in a way that can be implemented directly in the C++ compiler, let's say using template expression systems, so that as you said, we don't want to give up performance and we also want uh, uh, nice abstractions to be able to code easily. Do you think that could be the future of DSL and 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 your views about that? Yeah, so I, I, I miss, I think, the first part of the question. So I think you were asking about the concrete expression system that we have within the compiler, if we have analyzed maybe the, the expressive in, expressive in yeah, yeah. Uh, so you explained the expression system which would uh, look at this compilation graph and then uh, kind of optimize this compilation graph again but but what I'm asking is what if if we use the abstractions inside the language itself rather than doing uh, 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 these these optimizations where we saw the performance loss um, yeah but actually so it, the DSL compiler is actually using those abstractions so we are not uh, we're, so when uh, maybe you're referring to the to those compiler graphs where I said that it's very difficult to transform those compiler graphs. So we are not we're we are not transforming those compiler graphs from from one to another. We are generating them with with yeah with with rewrites on the tensor expressions. Yes, and that, that was kind of the point of that slide that um, from the DSL right since since we since we have this expression, it's easier to do rewrites to then linearize that computation into different types of C plus plus code. So that's that's exactly what what we were doing, and um, yeah, and I think and I know your work, and I'm, I'm looking forward to your to your to presentation tomorrow yeah. because I, I still think that there is a lot of um, 
things that we we can explode from from what you are figuring out with your with your boost like C plus plus embedding and maybe things that could be raised into into the ESL abstraction. So I think there's a lot of interesting stuff there. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Here in the room, we have another question from Michael. Yes, it's rather technical. Also, so my question is: Have you, have you shown me all these compiler graphs and, and talked about transformations between them, and also, I mean, realization then of them in, 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 in hardware? My, my question is a bit: So these graphs are from from a math perspective, they are directed graphs, right? Yes. And the, the hard issue this is now my my question is maybe that if you want to compare them or transform them. You would like to have to linear order them first, yeah. and then you could do it quite good, right? Yeah. And the question is to find somehow a perturbation or a cut of the graph such that it becomes linear orderable, so R cyclic, so then I can have a linear order of each of the graphs, mm -hmm. then it becomes a tree, and then I can do these transformations. So somehow the key qu question from, from a math perspective. There. Yeah, so I, I, I like math questions. Yeah, so 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 in principle, let, let me rephrase a little bit what you what you're saying. Yeah. So let's say our starting point is this graph, which is a cyclic directed graph yeah. in the general case. Um, it has it has labeled edges because some edges are controlled, some edges are free. okay. And a transformation will create new graphs. And yeah. So what you are I think what you are referring to is can we find out what is the sequence of transformations that give us potentially all possible graphs. Mm -hmm. uh, because you said something about like ordering those graphs. Yeah. And I think that's what I no, 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 I'm trying to find the ordering of the nodes of the graph. Ah, okay. So, okay, that's even simpler because I was going to go into a very no, 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 no. Okay. sketchy area. But okay, yeah. so um, yeah, so if you have a, a cyclic graph and in, in a sense what the compiler is doing is finding an order, right? An order is oh. a schedule, like in which yeah. order should things be executed. Um, so yeah, that's that's what they that's what compilers do. But the thing is that there are some stuff, say an order is enforced by dependencies. Some of these edges here are dependencies. Something has to be computed before something else. Yes. But the interesting thing is that if you give me a piece of C++ code, there are some dependencies there that are only there because you wrote that in C++. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that is, that started being looked at into the compiler community only recently. Uh, because we compiled very usually, we have to respect all dependencies, right? This has to work like that. Uh, but in reality, you don't have to. And the, the, the easiest example is commutativity. That if you have a tree, you can compute it in any order, in theory, right? Not, not with real floating point numbers, but that's another, another yeah. discussion. Um, so yeah, so that's what compilers are doing. But it's not only, so, so my point is that there are some algebraic things or some transformations that actually could violate dependencies that will actually have an order that is not the one induced by this graph. So even those things have to be considered and they are very difficult to consider from, from, this, from, this, from this graph here. Uh, the, the other question that I wanted to answer is that in, in principle, mathematically, you could think of rewrite systems that will give you all possible graphs. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, in, in some reduce yeah. cases, we can do that actually. It's a, it's a beautiful polyhedral yeah. message where you can actually write and write a systems of equations that give you all possible orderings. Yeah. And um, another question is which one is the better one? Sure. And for that you need cost models. Yes. And the cost models of today are actually not satisfactory. That's why many people go into machine learning for auto-tuning and to okay. predict costs. So that's also something that, that people do. So with in, in the area of polyhedral compilers, yes, you can get a very detailed view of that graph and you can actually formalize it as a, as a linear program of all possible schedules and then explore that area of all possible schedules. And that's something that uh, we actually work on. It's a, a very interesting area. I'm just asking because uh, we had some years ago uh, published a paper on, on, a, on, a, on a code for a graph theoretical problem, which is exactly this. You have a directed graph weighted maybe, mm -hmm. and you ask what's the minimal set or the minimum cuts I have to make yeah. that should make it R cyclic and then I and use a linear ordering of that. Yeah. And the algorithm we also have for, for in principle, it's NP hard problem or yeah. NP complete problem, but we have a very good heuristic, which is very tied to the, to the optimal solution, which you could do by, by uh, linear programming. Mm -hmm. 
And we tested this also for, for graphs which came from circuit testing for IBM yeah. things like this. And, and the, the, the only thing, so we have published it and it's nice, but we have not really made a step to truly really apply it somewhere. And yeah. that's why. Uh, okay, so, so you are. So this is, and this was for the domain decomposition? For, for no, it was just really the graph. And now when you want to have what's the what's the best cut yeah, yeah. I can do, with such, then I get the linear order of, of the graph. Okay, yeah. And then now I, I just came back to this question, yeah. maybe, yeah. And, and so, yeah, so, so those, those kind of, so I, I know those kind of, is a, I guess, yeah. Yeah, that's not like like Metis, but those kind of cut algorithms right? yeah. to, to, to cut uh, graphs. But that's part of the of the of the issue. Sure. The other part is uh, you have multiple possible linear orderings, and, and it's difficult to predict which one is the one that gives you the better performance. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's two types of questions. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. We could look at, send, send, me, send me the paper. Maybe we yeah, have sure, sure. Maybe we have a use case for that. Yeah, this, this, would, this would, yeah, this would be nice. Yeah. Okay. Um now this talk was more about I think um targeting heterogeneous um targets. Um so this person is maybe missing the topic a bit, but um it's more about um, HPC at scale, because in my experience, HPC at scale um, still has some unsolved problems that don't need to be unsolved because they are solved in other domains. Like, for example, if you have a node failure in, in HPC, you just have to hope you have a, a, a snapshot or something to restart from. Yeah. While in other domains, big data node failure is not a huge problem. Yeah. Do you see a chance to solve such issues and overcome this by um, these kinds of methods by compilers, or is there any research being done on that? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, this talk was mostly about heterogeneous systems and uh, mostly on the nodes. And I mean, of course, we can also generate code for homogeneous multi-cores without. Um, but yeah, that's that's mostly what we're what we're doing here. Um, yeah, so I, I so the, the answer is the quick answer is I don't know, but we do have work on other DSLs that are like DSLs for different systems as you're as you're saying, uh, where because the, the, the major problem there is the state, right? You you want to be able to understand the state of a system, the state of what a node is computing on, mm -hmm. right? And, and so, yeah, from the systems community, there are there are approaches for that, right? Like uh, to have um, the idea of uh, transactions and, and consistent state and, and logging and, and redoing and time debugging kind of aspects, right? We can actually time-wise go back in time and see what's the, st the status of this of the system at every time, and that's very important for these systems to deal with failures and so on and so forth. So my answer is we we do have some. DSLs, but I didn't talk about them here for data flow kind of systems, where uh, we have worked a little bit on, on that question of state and, and how can we capture the state there. We need abstraction for state and what is in a state update and how can you undo a, 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 a state update. And that's the kind of thing that you would require for, for what you're getting at, right? If, and you know, if a node fails, I need to be able to redo from the previous state and, and maybe or reconstruct that all from, from the beginning. Um, but that's not HPC related. So that's not, um, so that language that we're using for this kind of data flow models is more like microservice kind of oriented architecture and uh, not HPC. But maybe you have something in mind where you, where you, where you see a connection. Yeah, it's just because having this kind of DSL, if you talk about state, um, I think this DSL understands you actually know what the state means and do more, yeah. have more assumptions about it that helps dealing with exactly those problems. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe it could be added. Yes. Yeah, indeed. I don't know. You always, as I always think about HPC, you have some, some, something so tightly coupled that you, I mean, if everything should be working, I think. Do that scale indeed. Good questions. Yeah. Okay. Hey. Okay.
It's about the energy. I'm, I'm curious about to know what is the energy exactly. Is that it? I think the number of the operation, number of the main operation is the CPU. The so, so I have one. Can you still hear me? Michelle, hi. Hi, can we have another question here? Hi. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Ah, okay, perfect. Sorry. Louder. Yeah, I just was Connection is the definition of the energy and the how measure we. Yeah, so energy, energy here in this plot, let me, let me go there. Um, so energy here is actually energy in the physical sense, it's joules. Um, so this is, to do that on set up here. Uh, okay, so, so here, so if you if you do g gigaflops per watt, so this this second and watt that turns into joules. Mm -hmm. So this is really what is the amount of energy that the system uses. So this is what you end up paying in the bill, in the energy bill. So same for the for the MPC and computing and stuff. So this is energy in the sense of work. Mm -hmm. right? so, um, so this is power in terms of what and how this is measured. Like in this, so here we're using the alveo. Uh, FPGA, and so this is actually measured physically. So there is, mm -hmm. so we measure, there, there are some monitors that allows you to measure how much um, current and voltage goes into the system. Okay, Michael, um, now the stage is yours. Yes, um, so, so I was wondering, um, as as we already as you already mentioned, there's there's other levels in the system like uh, you talked about microservices already, in some sense. If we look at modern HPC and especially the convergence between HPC and large scale data analytics, I kind of wonder if we, we basically need a representation of computing that's going beyond a single hardware platform and beyond a single node because because actually we 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 see certain problems on every level you know we see them we see them in computing but we also see them in io um and i'm i'm wondering if if because we're now putting a lot of intelligence in compilers if compilers are might might develop into a tool that is much more um, versatile and not not focused on a single single hardware platform. Like you know, I already have a I can already buy systems where I have an FPGA, a GPU, and a CPU in one node. And and usually what I do is I compile certain things, certain parts of my code for each platform, and then I basically just distribute the work for some ways. But, but I could think that, that having a broader view of that would be extremely helpful to, to better match what you want to do to the available hardware and maybe even go beyond that, you know, because still, still even between nodes, you have similar things, but with totally different latencies and totally different bandwidths, of course, but in the end, you can, you can parameterize that and, and basically uh, go go to a go to a much broader view. What what would be your your? Do you think that's a that's a good view, or do you actually think that that we should stick to the to the optimization of the parts of the system and then stick it together in a different way? Yeah, uh, that's again a, a very good question. So so what you are touching upon is very related to what we're trying to do in Everest. And that's why it's, this slide is good with this, this convergence, HPC, big data, ML. And um, there, uh, when, we, when we talk about a compiler in that context, we're not talking about like a traditional compiler that is creating code for one node, but you will also want to be able to look into the issues of, for instance, partitioning a model across multiple, multiple FPGAs, uh, generating kind of a, is we call it like a system development kit, but that's something that we're working towards. And uh, so it, it's exactly what you're saying, right? In the, in the interfacing between workflows, if you wish, right? you have multiple workflows and they will be deployed in different places. And so there's also the IO question. Um, so there's a lot of optimization problems hidden 
a very different uh, different levels of, of say granularity, you know, abstraction by granularity. And uh, yeah, the compiler traditionally has been at the, at the very fine granularity level on instructions and moving data in and out of caches. But yeah, with this kind of project, we're moving into a, a larger scope of optimization. That's not only the compiler, but also like the, the, the hardware generation, the, uh, the definition of, of uh, interfaces, even hardware interfaces and memory interfaces. So that's something that we are looking into. So, so the answer is yes. I think that's somewhere something that is important. Um, now, to the to the point of to what extent the problems are the same but at different granularity levels. Yes, I think that observation is correct. Um, the, the thing is that the devil is always in the details, right? So, so even like a compiler is doing a scheduling problem, but uh, there are so many instantiations of a scheduling problem. And, and the same thing is that like a database compiler is doing also a scheduling problem, right? but it's it's actually difficult to reuse those things. Even if they, if from far away the problems look very similar, uh, when you go into the details and, and, and work on the algorithm and the heuristics to, to optimize something, um, things start uh, stop looking so so much alike. Um, so so that's just a, a, I guess some word of caution. But yeah, so the ideally we would really like the methods that we work on, on say, on the fine, fine granularity to be applicable at higher granularity levels. But I think uh, it's, it's, it's maybe not going to be that easy. I, I should be at Görlitz right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for this. I would, I would love to expand on this one. Thank you very much. <laughs> It's, it's not so far away. I hope there's going to be an opportunity to meet again. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Okay, Hermione, Hermione more. Thank you. Uh, I think we answered our questions and uh, the time is up, quarter past uh, uh, three. Thanks for coming to Gurlitz. Nice to have you. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye to every one of you. Thanks for the people attending online. Thanks for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks.